What is up, theology nerds? This is Trip. This is Nathan. And we are sitting here um, at the podcasting station. That's right. The, the pod desk. Yeah, the pod desk. The pod deck. Oh, uh, the hub of podcasting. There you go. There you go. <laughs> at, uh, at the hatchery on the beach. And this is an intro for the Theology Nerd Podcast. And, and, and here's the thing. The podcast today has been hijacked by two authors from the Homebrew Christianity Guide series. They, they figured out how to get into our accounts and... They just went crazy. Yeah. So uh, Eric Hall, who wrote the Homebrew Christianity Guide to God, and Jeff Pugh, who wrote the Guide to the End, uh, did the Theology Nerd podcast this week. So I was on just on my computer, just like doing normal stuff, you know, getting work, work which done. Is, which is what you're supposed to do. That's what I'm supposed to do. And all of a sudden, Eric and Jeff pop up, and they're like, hey, we're just going to talk and report stuff. And... They didn't have shirts on, so I don't know what that was about. But it's an audio podcast, so you're all good. So, so you don't know, you didn't have to see that, but I did. And I just wanted to share that with you. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, you, after you hear this, you may say to yourself, "Oh, clearly I've already bought multiple copies of Trip's book, so The you Guide buy to Jesus." Multiple copies of these books of too. Eric, Eric, Eric's book, Guide to God, Jeff's book, uh, Guide to the End. Uh, luckily, this month of April in the year 2017. All three of the Homebrew Christianity guidebooks that are out are currently two ninety nine on Kindle and the Nook. I found out Ooh. Barnes and Noble Nook. If you're a Nooker, then uh, you can get the books for two ninety nine. Nookery. Yeah. If you if you don't read Nooks or Kindles, you can buy physical copies as well. Luckily, the guidebooks are not expensive books, but they're even cheaper on ebook this yeah. this month. So you got to hop on that. You don't want to miss out. No, you got to buy so many so that you guys get. Higher up in the, in the rankings. Yeah, there was there was a day where um, where Eric's book was the number one book on debating theism on e- on Kindle. Well, there you go. I know. I was like, you just stuck it to Dan Dennett, <laughs> and, uh, and and what's that? What's Ravi Zacharias or something like that? I don't know. He's like an apologist. He likes mm. to to prove to everybody that you know God's real and mm. probably Trinitarian. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that happened. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. If you if you if you don't have the books yet, you can also go to homebrewedguides.com and you can purchase the whole set. Like How many all, are in the set? There are ten. What? And uh, I know, like in next week or so, next week or the week after, the Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Church History is getting printed. So oh, it'll be headed nice. your way soon if you're on the list of those. You get the entire set. So you get the ones that come out. They'll all get mailed to you. You'll get a really sweet card in it, um, a deacon card, where for the first time I'm with you after you get it, I buy your drink, which happened last that week. That just happened, didn't I it? Know. No. No. <laughs> anyway, um, and you'll get some stickers and stuff in it, along with an email to download like eight different high-gravity classes, stuff I did with Peter Rollins, with Philip Clayton, all kinds of stuff. If you buy the whole books set at once, and it's uh, and you get all the perks, and you don't pay shipping and stuff when they come out, so you should consider that prayerfully. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I, yeah. That's yeah. What you say it like that. You gotta meditate on it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah. So one other thing I was gonna say before letting Eric and Jeff attempt to do that they have not spent nine years doing. <laughs> <laughs> People listen to this. They say to they say to us they trip. How, how come Homebrew Christianity is such a professional sounding podcast? Mm. It's always so put together mm-hmm. and, and clear and concise and gets to the point. And you don't have long rambling intros and things because no. you know it's up. You do. And yeah. I say, you keep it professional. I say, look, I've been doing this nine years. I've been doing it nine years. So you can tell how long someone's been doing it based on how long their intros are. Absolutely. Yeah. Newsworthy with no Norsworthy. This guy got forty second intro, but yeah. that's all he got. Amateur. That's all. All he has. He's like, no, I just want to feature the guest voices and stuff. Maybe, maybe, but when you're not even involved in the actual episode itself, because Jeff and Eric are talking, I just feel like um, I should up front try to l- let them take over. Uh, I'm going to tell you one of my favorite things in each of their books. That's what I'm going to do. There you go. I'm nice. There you go. That's a nice thing you do. Jeff wrote the book on the end. One of my favorite things. Um, let's see. Well, wh- one thing I didn't know when I was editing the, the, gu- the guide to the end is. Just how serious these people that make the charts about the end of the world are. Like you t- get the whole backstory of people Daniel seven and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff lining up foreign policy, 
building, like when the Lord's going to come back on this day. He tells the whole history of where it came from, and then how it spread, and how it got popular. And uh, it kind of, all one, it freaked me out because I didn't realize just how uncomfortable everything it says is. Yeah. The other thing is, it made me think: if people can figure that out, then the, then we should be able to make not crappy theology <laughs> popular. Like you don't have to learn a chart and all kinds of stuff. You just have to learn how to read the scripture where um, God's not. A Zionist, anti-Muslim, and USSR yeah, but, uh, hater, and but it's a chart, you know. Like yeah. Everybody loves a good chart. Well, okay, we, so should, we, we need to make a chart. Progressive Christian Bible charts. That's it. Um, it Called it. It, it. Instead, instead of like apocalyptic passages, it's the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> so when it says like <laughs> pray for your enemy, it, it like just shows a little chart of you praying. <laughs> I like it. And then you have a thought bubble of. Whoever the current enemy is, so you, you'll be able charts. to buy this soon on uh, homebrewchristianity.com. So yeah, you hear that, Jesse? That. Jesse, <laughs> Jesse, the elder of graphical sweetness. That's what we need. We're going to be calling you soon. <laughs> um, yeah, in in the other thing in it um, was uh, in a number of places in the book, he talks about how you begin conversations with people uh, in very different perspectives in different parts of the church around uh, texts that tend to be. Uh, um, politically charged like these, which is good. Yeah, useful. Um, Eric, but best part of Eric's book are all the places where I added uh, comments. That's what I was gonna. I was. Gonna I added wait, lots of comments to, in Eric's book. That um, My favorite part about Eric's book is all the stuff I added. <laughs> yeah, about process. <laughs> no, um, I, I, I personally, as someone who read three different versions of Eric's book, this is by far the best one. <laughs> <laughs> really, you should have you should have bought the second version. It was way better. No, the, the first the first version of of the book. There were no cool characters. It wasn't like God is Miyagi mm. or retired yeah, Oprah yeah. or 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 hippie your hippie aunt in a drum circle. Yeah, yeah. Or Jersey Shore God. Yeah. Or Joan of Arc God. Those those five great examples that once you read the opening two chapters describing the different kind of dominant images of God, it all sticks in your head. And it was so good um, after he, it, it, in the rewrites that I have found in a couple conversations going back to his examples and using them, which I find problematic because mm. I think I should have. You should have come over I should have had my own examples, yeah. but I borrowed his. I didn't tell them about it. <laughs> I didn't footnote them verbally. Yeah, it's a gray area. It's great. I mean, if you're the if you're a series editor, yeah. you get partial credit for the cool parts. That's true. I mean, it does say homebrew Christianity. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, this is Jeff and Eric, and uh, and the books were currently on sale this month on the Nook on the Kindle, ebook style. Tell your friends, and uh, I hope you enjoy it because next week uh, they're not going to be talking. Nope. No, I might talk about them. Oh yeah, we're gonna have a whole special yeah episode next week. There'll probably be a lot of edits at the beginning of the. They would just have to go in to explain where errors took place. That's right. Yeah. I mean, they may both they may, they both have like professional teaching chairs with names of people in front mm-hmm. of. Like they have like fancy chairs. Yeah. Like yeah. the kind you get when you're a professor named after somebody in an endowment. Um, so you know that means someone loves them <laughs> and them all. All right. Enjoy. So I'm uh, I'm Eric Hall. I am a uh, I'm a professor in Helena, Montana. In fact, I am called the uh, Raymond uh, G. Sorry, Archbishop Raymond G. Hunthausen, uh, professor of philosophy and theology, which is a very Germanesque title in my uh, book, but it makes me sound far more important than I am. Yeah, I'm Jeffrey Pugh. I'm the Maud Sharp Powell Professor of Religious <laughs> Studies at Elon University in North Carolina, and we're here today to talk about. About God and the end. God. <laughs> we're, we're bringing an end to it all. Yep. <laughs> so, Eric, um, I'll just go ahead and say that I enjoyed your book, um, and and I learned a lot about God. I'm not sure I learned everything I need to know, but I learned, I learned a whole bunch. And one of the yeah. things that I learned is that you and I share sort of a common um, journey in the in the path of faith, which was the Assemblies of God. So tell me how a good Assemblies of God attending boy can become 
uh, endowed professor at a Catholic uh, in a Catholic chair. Indeed. Um, yeah. So I, I, I entered the Assemblies of God Church. We had had affiliations, loose affiliations with the Assemblies of God Church through my family uh, for most of my life. I entered when I was 15 after I had lost my father. Um, and uh, I, I entered a church that, frankly, showed me likely the most amount of love that I will ever uh, have experienced again. I remain uh, in deep gratitude to this church and the people whom I still keep in contact with uh, through it. Um, so they, they fostered in me a sense of uh, relationship when my when my mother was at wit's end and uh, couldn't bear uh couldn't bear me being a sad teenager anymore. Uh, and, and, uh, then I went to a, uh, an assemblies of God college. And at that college, I realized that, uh, I had more intellect than I ever thought that I knew I had planned on becoming a youth pastor at this point. Now I like to joke, I entered the professorship so that I didn't become a youth pastor long road there. Um, but I started questioning the basic tenets of uh, what I would say is actually evangelical theology that Pentecostal thought came to rely on. I've actually kept an openness to the idea of the spirit, though I, I don't put much weight on the notion of tongues, to be totally honest with you. Um, uh, but I've kept a notion of uh, openness to the spirit and wherever I've gone. And I, and I do thank the AG for that. But uh, the evangelical theology of the cross that God... Uh, beats his son and that God determines all aspects of our lives. I had huge questions about that. I found that it, uh, as I began to enter philosophy through, um, a Catholic thinker named Bernard Lonergan. Uh, and then as I got into Aristotle, Plato, St. Thomas, and any number of other good Catholic thinkers, uh, the whole world fell apart for me. And I had to find myself anew in and through, and I can claim this, uh, Platonism. I'm one of the very few people, I think, uh, after the third century who can claim that they were a full-blown Platonist for at least a short stint of his or her life. <laughs> oh, I'm not even sure what that would look like, but I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. We're going to talk about it. I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that journey. I also, um, being a little bit older, I was part of that wave in the late sixties, early seventies of the Jesus movement. Yep. Um, Jesus freaks and stuff. And, uh, we were all a bunch of burned out old hippies who, who, uh, <laughs> who after we had exhausted ourselves in, in drugs, I guess, turned to turn to Christ yeah. Um, some of them it took, some of them it didn't. But um, but I remember uh, I ended up at uh, for a time at, at the Glad Tidings Assemblies of God mm-hmm. and came to appreciate them, but also had to so turn on because um, it became uh, evident to me that it was more about power. Yep. Um, and and that, thank you. Yeah. And that um, power was more important than uh, servanthood, uh, maybe even suffering, sure. um, which became sort of the centrality of my theology as I went on was Ooh. how to make sense um, or how to understand the enormous suffering of the world if God was a remote and inaccessible, transcendently um, unknown. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, that I couldn't, I couldn't make sense of that. My heart could make sense of that. Um, so ended up becoming whatever heretical form of, uh, faith it is that I am now. Um, <laughs> it's all like, something. I would like to say it's Aaronian. I like it. Um, which doesn't get exactly, uh, the kind of play that, uh, Augustinian, uh, understandings have acquired and assumed in our world. Before we go any further on this, though, I just want to say that I'm, I'm, I, I don't know if the listeners will be able to hear this or see this, but I'm struck by the uh, artwork behind you of the skulls. Yeah. Um, and I hope that you don't try to uh, make love in that bed. Um, <laughs> Always with zombies watching. You know, I mean, because, you know, that would be total buzzkill for me. Um <laughs> I do want to say that I've seen images remarkably like that both in Mexico yep. um, and also, uh, oddly enough, in Sweden, um, in, churches, uh, in, in churches, 
um, where the artwork was with a, uh, a skeleton who in gardening, um, putting uh, soil in pots and stuff. So it's interesting that on this Holy Saturday, um, we think about our mortality. Um, that, that, that is, in fact, a part of, of who we are as a people of faith. Um, I, as I read your book, um, and I worked through Miyagi God and Jersey Shore God and, and uh, Oprah God and my hippie aunt God, um, <laughs> which were different ways of talking about, I think, classical theology and process theology and deism and other forms. Um, so you give a kind of a, a way of understanding that without the sort of philosophical constructs that may make people turn away. Sure. And one of the great benefits of your book is that you draw people into those images and those ideas. But I was sort of struck as I was sort of working my way through your book. And then last night, which was Good Friday service at our church, um, thinking about Pilate's question to Jesus, what is truth? Sure. So I wonder if you could help me understand for you, how do you get to the truth of God? What is truth um, in that way? Yeah, that's a, th- thanks for that question. That That's huge. Um, and I, and I have a feeling this has to unfold dialectically as I think all, uh, all truth <laughs> ultimately does, if you will. Um, I, I approach truth from two perspectives and, uh, as we were sort of foregrounding this talk a little bit ago, you're right. I have this, what's called a Thomistic understanding of truth that there's sort of a natural truth that we can come by and come to by the natural light of intellect in our mind's eye. And then there is a engraced truth, which all truth is drawn up into, which might just as well be a bad LSD trip to be totally honest with you. And I'll drop into that distinction here but um yeah the you know so i think that we we oftentimes frame truth today in terms of the sciences um and we say that the sciences gain us truth um and the funny thing about that statement is if you say that to my friend john rowley a chemist he goes oh don't ascribe truth to what i'm doing this makes me really uncomfortable i'm coming up with models of uh, phenomena that I think best explain the phenomena. And I go, well, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, uh, and I say to him, well, yeah, that's exactly actually what I think most of us mean by truth. Most of the time, a reasoned opinion about something as opposed to a mere preference. Um, It's the best way of explaining a data that we're confronted with. Now, my critique of the sciences is that they reduce all phenomenon that we should pay attention to, to what I would call the material constant. So stuff that we can look at, if you will, uh, that we can measure and that is grounded in the material world. And so all I'm saying is that the true that we can know extends beyond that in that we can know, for instance, certain values, or we can understand certain ideas about the true itself, uh, namely that it is, even if we can't say the content of it. Um, and that's about as far as the intellect will draw us. And then we're presented with what's classically called revelation. I don't like putting uh, revelation, if you will, into a- uh, epistemic terms. I think that's reductionistic. I don't think it captures what we mean by revelation when we talk about revelation. I like to say if it's a truth that is in grace for no reason or for reasons beyond the purely rational, we're drawn up into a narrative that uh, say the narrative of Christ that we wouldn't otherwise get to from some purely naturalistic perspective. And in that we begin to, and in and through the assumptions that we take up through that, we are drawn into an entirely different world. And I call this the world of Jesus. It's the world that Pilate has to reject. Pilate, I think in this particular moment, He's accepting the world as we can find it to the best of our natural knowledge. He's saying, look, Jesus, if I set you free, you're going to start a revolution that will unleash Roman hordes upon Jerusalem. He's having a very pragmatic, I think, uh, moment 
wherein he's going to sacrifice the one for the many, as the biblical texts put it, right? And uh, he's right by all rational accounts to do so. And yet it's in and through the beauty of Christ that we're also drawn into the idea that he is the truth. And the truth that he unfolds and that he manifests is not it's pertinent to the world as we know it, but it's a critique of, it draws us into a world as it was supposed to have been, I suppose is the best way to put it. So this, this raises an interesting question for me. Um, so would it be revelation um, that the state uh, and its purposes are always antithetical to the reign of God? That in this moment, in this moment before Pilate, we have before us two choices. And I hate to be binary. I mean, I know, you know, binary, it's helpful here. you know, sure. um, so even with all of the provisional sort of ellipses or whatever, you know, that we can put around that binary choice, that in this moment, in this narrative, in this text, we have a kind of striking revelation that there are values. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just try to put this in terms that sure. that uh, I hope feed back into what you were saying earlier. Absolutely, yeah. That there are values, that there are truths, that there is a, a um, uh, I don't want to say an aesthetic, but I will, uh, yeah, sure. uh, that that we follow uh, certain certain paths that lead us into those. Um, so we, we follow pilot and his values. Um, I want to keep peace. I want to maintain order. Um, I don't care if I have to use violence to do it. Right. Um, my reign is built on violence. And then there's the, if you will, the aesthetic, the revelation, um, the, uh, of, the reign of the one who created us, the desire of the one who created us um, operates from a different set of assumptions about the world and about how we build community. So would that be revelation? I believe it would be. It, uh, you know, I've, I've always found the Lutheran notion of revelation to be really helpful, that it's a reorientation of the Entire, it's not a content per se, it unfolds into a content, but it's a reorientation of the self to the truth that is Christ. So, in that sense, I mean, and I, I kind of love that. In that sense, then, revelation is not necessarily something that comes from outside us in, but it is something that emerges from within us to understand the world in a different way. Well, that, that's a good question, and I'm, I'm curious to hear how you would uh, want to phrase this, too. Um, in some ways, it comes from the outside, depending on what one means there. Hermeneutically, it comes from the outside, uh, or, you know, in our interpretive categories. Even if it's illuminating, if you will, something that has always been here and already should have been in some ways. I guess that's one way that I would want to put it. Because if God is indeed always moving in and through all of us, then this has always already been here, at least as I have to interpret God. And yet Christ, as the hermeneutic of the world, uh he does bring something new with him that we didn't already have access to. So, I, you know, I guess I'm Kierkegaardian here. Kierkegaard makes this claim that Christ, unlike Socrates, isn't merely a midwife for uh, for entering into the truth, um, which I think is a beautiful uh, idea that Socrates draws out in the Meno. Um, Christ is the condition for the capacity to see the truth. But the truth has always been, nonetheless, if we put it in this from the standpoint of truth. So then, when we come to God, how do, how do we know the truth? <laughs> oh, I mean, uh, you just hit me with the million dollar question there. And, and, and I, I didn't. I, I'm not trying to. Obviously, I'm not trying to trap you. No, um, no, no. I know that. I, that's I'm, just a hard question. That, I'm that's trying to. Question. I'm trying to lead us into kind of thinking about this for the. The eight people that may listen to this later on. <laughs> hey, people, but uh, pick up the books while they're still on sale too. <laughs> yeah, two ninety nine on Kindle. Um, on Kindle. So I guess I ask that question because, for instance, as I'm reading through your book, 
Yeah. Um, and, and you talk about the Miyagi God, yep. um, which, you know, and you can explain that for our listeners, but, but I'm thinking to myself that this of course was the first sort of, uh, nascent image of God that I had, mm-hmm. you know, the God of omnipotence, omniscience, who runs the world, who nothing happens without, I mean, it's sort of like the pre-skeptical Job, um, understanding that Job's friends have, um, in a certain sense. So that, so that the world runs on the basis of a certain ability of God to control things and stuff. And so we all sort of take that image until it starts to bust up into its logical contradictions. Yeah. Some of which you talk about in your book, you know, can God create a rock so heavy God can lift? I mean, but it, but ultimately, it comes up against the door of suffering, the omnipotent, omniscient, classic yes. uh, God. And that's the point where maybe for me, at least, I can only speak for myself. Mm-hmm. I, I, I came to the point where I had to realize that that construct of God had to die. Sure. Um, if I was to make any sense out of the revelation of Christ. Yep. Um, and I think a number of other different people come to this. Bonhoeffer comes to this and his, um, and throughout his writings, but especially he has very poignant and, and, uh, powerful sections and letters and papers from prison, um, where he understands that the metaphysical God, um, is, is a God that ultimately cannot do us any good. Sure. I'll just stop there and let you respond. Oh, sure. So, I, I do want to draw out a major distinction. Um, I think that the God that I call Jersey Shore can fall into all these traps um, or does de facto fall into all these traps. Uh, and this is the God that we generally think of. We combine this with some sort of deism, right? This is what I call at the beginning. Uh, God is cosmic vending machine. Um and the the God that we need to appease, almost a Greco-Roman like God. Um, uh, you know, this is the one that we ascribe omnipotence to, in the sense that God can do anything. God can make two plus two equal five. These types of things. And I, I think I'm rejecting this vision of God, this sort of monergistic God that controls all things, that draws them all onto uh, a particular end without any freedom and without any uh, w- without any capacity to to act on its own. Um, I actually think the classical vision of God, in many ways, uh, one we 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 would get upset by the ascription of omnipotence to this God. I don't because I think I, I I'm interpreting it. Okay. Uh, but omnipotence means that God can do what is best, which means that God does what is identical to who God is. And you, re- you realize that's not the nuanced understanding that majority of people have. Right? Oh, I know. And it's what I'm trying to save in some ways is we don't have to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I want to throw out the bathwater. I really do. And in fact, I think we have to reinterpret the ancient theistic God rightly through Christ. And it will draw in to contention uh, some very, very important things, including the ultimate transcendence of this God. And it brings us into the absolute scandal that this God not only cares for us, but somehow comes to us and dies for us or enters into death would be the better way to put it uh, for me. And this actually is why I come to depend also on um, process categories as well is I, I think they become really helpful even if I reject certain if you will metaphysical ideas within process I think the categories have reframed the debate in a really helpful manner that I want to take up that in hermeneutics um, so uh, you know while I reject Jersey Shore I gotta go theistic and yet even there I, I still think your points stand. Um, we we reach this point where I would say, okay, I can affirm order in the world, which is the affirmation of uh, not an orderer, but frankly, order unto itself <laughs> uh, for me. But that, that's about as far as I can get. And maybe I can begin to discuss certain 
uh, certain ideas that unfold around this is uh, this God transcendent or imminent? Well, both in some ways. Is this God uh, eternal or temporal? I, I think eternal, if I'm going to say that it's the identity undergirding all things. Uh, but But that's about it. And that's not very helpful. And it's indeed the suffering that you were talking about that draws us into anything beyond that. So, you know, I'm teaching a course right now called Atrocity, Suffering, and God, where we are studying historical holocausts, uh, slavery, Native American genocide, um, the uh, Armenian genocide, uh, and, uh, and the, the Japanese uh, genocide against Nanking. Okay, so this... Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, go, go go, yeah, go, no, go ahead, go ahead. So, so this brings up sort of one of the most difficult questions uh, for people when they yeah. consider the claims of God on life. Yeah. Um, what do we do with the genocides of Hebrew scripture? Uh, yeah, I, I have my thoughts here, and it actually pertains to some of my questions I have for you with regard to biblical hermeneutics, which, which I think your book is wisely really a book about, how to read the Bible properly. Um, There's some of that in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I think I think it was, it was really helpful. Uh, yeah, uh, the it depends on where you envision the truth and where you envision revelation for that question, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I at least want to assert that the hermeneutic or the interpretive key for understanding scripture is revelation. But revelation and scripture aren't identical to one another. Revelation is found primarily in Christ as Christ comes to me in some sort of event-like structure. And then Christ, if you will, the one who... So so in Matthew, we get Christ living out Israel as Israel was always supposed to have been. There's, a, there's always this debate in Israel. That's why I liked your Daniel chapter so well, is I think you drew out this debate for me even more so. Who are we to be as Israel in light of a world that not only despises us, but wants to see us snuffed out of existence? And you have at least two options. You have the Davidic option, which is to try to crush the world in return, or you have the suffering servant option, or perhaps the uh, option of those who are in Daniel to say, we have to wait on God and do our best in the meantime. And I think that's uh, with some important other ideas, what Christ takes up. And as he stands on the Sermon on the Mount, as Moses stood on uh, Mount, what is it? Uh, the well, the mountains overlooking the promised land, right? Mm -hmm. Christ says something completely different. Rather than sending Joshua forth with swords clanking, he sends his disciples in with the horrific teachings that the peacemakers will be blessed, that the righteous will see heaven, and, the, and that the poor are who we should seek to be. And I yeah. think this is to be contrasted here, and it's that hermeneutic, this hermeneutic of peace that Christ ultimately uh, is that reinterprets how we should see all scripture. So we should look back and say, whoa, you shouldn't have killed those people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, right. Okay, so, you know, this is sort of hard for some listeners, I guess, to wrap their head around, but... Sure. If, if we see text, even the biblical text, in some sense, is incarnational, yep. um, which probably might be my hermeneutic, like um, then the union of the human and the divine, um, you can see that that union is also the sort of the struggle that that we have um, as we come to the text, right? And as those texts are generated, um, I've come to see that, um, and I'm sure this is where my heresy comes in, that, for instance, when we approach Hebrew scripture, um, we see Israel struggling um, with the command of God. And I'm not so sure that some of those commands that they put in the text as being of God are of God. Um, I think they are justification for behaving in a certain way or doing a certain thing. Now, where people then would sort of come back to me then is saying, well, then you're being anti-Semitic or you're being anti-Jewish. Um, and I'm, I don't mean to be that way. What I mean to do is call attention to the fact that, 
as I think you, you just said, the counter narratives to conquest are already embedded within the very text themselves. The prophetic tradition, um, even though there are, and, and, and there's always tension in all of these texts, Christian and Jewish scripture alike. There's always the tension between the sort of um, the power and the suffering or the conquest and the serving. Um, you see these and you alluded to the suffering servant narratives um, that we have in Isaiah, for instance, or in other texts, Psalm 22. And, and there's a reason why the church goes back and performs midrash with those texts and brings those texts into its own identity, because those are the only texts that they have, right? Um, but those texts are not unified. They don't speak with a unified voice. And, and there is a, is a point in, if we think about Revelation, that we come to, or that I come to, okay, let me, let me not put this on anybody but myself. There's a point that I come to those texts and I say, I have a choice. I have a decision to make, which seems to me to more align, uh, an understanding of how I'm supposed to, to view these texts. Is it the crucified, um, and resurrected God, um, that I see working out in the life of Jesus of Nazareth? Um, and ultimately, all metaphysics, um, transcendence, eminence, um, you know, power, sure. uh, understanding, um, have to sort of, I place them sort of not at the service of, but um, I place them uh, in provisional tension. Yep. Um, with, because all things are provisional for me. I, you know, all truth is provisional for me because I simply do not have access to it. I may believe, I think like you, um, that, that the truth exists, but, but all my access to it, all my understandings of it will have to ultimately be provisional. Absolutely. Um, on this side of what Kant says that is the transcendental horizon, right? Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm perfectly happy to live out uh, faith in the tension between the sort of the already of the truth that I have and the not yet of the truth that I anticipate. Now, I don't know if any of that made sense, but oh, it made a ton of sense. Yeah. Um, as I'm approaching text, that's that's how I approach them. So, for instance, you alluded to Daniel, you know. Um, the way that I, the hermeneutic that I'm using when I'm understanding what the return of Christ means or the end times mean mm-hmm. um, is far different, say, for instance, it is in the vastly popular world of evangelical theology and dispensationalism. Mm-hmm. Um, when I go back to Daniel, I can't deny that those texts were written for a certain people at a certain time with their own particular tensions. How are we going to deal with Antiochus Epiphanes? How are we going to deal with Greeks um, who are desecrating our temple, who are um, desecrating our our identity? How are we going to deal with that? And Daniel, you know, he, he, he struggles just as much as, we do in our time mm-hmm. um, by saying that, well, you can, you can take up the sword. You can be Maccabeus. You can be Judas Maccabee and, and, and revolt. That is of course, one way. Um, or you can take another way, which I think Daniel is sort of referring to and saying that ultimately God will have God's way here. Okay. Um, I have to say that sometimes I do find myself, um, when you see suffering of such great magnitude, you do find yourself having some kind of emotive sympathy with, with revolt. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, as a Christian, I'm called to resist, but not to revolt. Yeah, amen. I, I, I mean, don't know if that, that makes any sense. But. All of that, uh, yeah, we're touching now on a number of... Uh, it's what I think are extremely important issues. And maybe I can backtrack and then uh, a little bit and then uh, ask you a few more questions about what, what the end is then, how we reinterpret the end. But I, I want to go back to a few points that you made that I think were beautifully stated. Um, 
Number one, um, I, I wonder if it's we who are in heresy uh, by proclaiming Christ the word rather than scripture as the word. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Uh, because I think scripture as a whole, at least within the context of the church and the Christian church, it's not a standalone text. It is rather a text that is interpreted in and through the person of Christ. Who is the word? This is what we proclaim. It's Christ that's the word. It's Christ that is the son of the father, not the Bible that is the son of the father. Right. Uh, that's that's what Bart says. Bart says that scripture bears witness to the word. Exactly. Yeah. No, I'm about as Bartian of a Catholic as you'll ever find, to be totally honest with you. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in that, um, you know, the, the anti-Semitic thing is actually really important. And I think you address it rightly when you say that it's not anti-Semitic to say that within a people, there's already a desire to see something different, right? The prophetic and the self-critique comes to us by way of two traditions, the Semitic and the Socratic. <laughs> and uh, both are uh, the capacity, the Semitic tra- tradition of self-critique um, underlays and uh, grounds any subsequent notions of critique and self-critique that we could ever have, which is, of, I think, of the most high and divine purposes, uh, if you will. So, I, I, yeah, I, I think I'm really sympathetic with you there as well, that, um, that this self-critique is already contained within the, the the tensions are there. Nehemiah says one thing, and that's what I was pointing at. He's seeking something like the return of the Davidic kingdom, as is Ezra. And Amos says something totally different. You were destroyed not because you failed in cultic practices. You failed because you ignored the poor and the orphan. Yeah. Yeah, that's an important word for us in America right now. It is. I mean, because the empire will fall because will. of those, those very things. Um, so, so I guess if, when we think about truth, um, and, and I, I do struggle with this constantly, yeah. sure. um, truth when earlier in my life, earlier before I became all edumacated, <laughs> um, truth was one thing. Yeah, that's right. And even when we come to the text, when we come to scripture, truth is not one thing. The counter narratives are embedded even in in Jewish text, in Jewish scripture. The counter narratives are already embedded that are asking and raising the question, is is the cultus, is the kingdom, is the monarchy, um, are those the things that lead to the life that God desires for God's people? And and what I appreciate so much about Jewish scripture is that those counter narratives are already embedded in there. Yep. Um, And sometimes in different ways and in different texts, but because there is a multiplicity of voices, I am allowed the freedom to sort of wrestle and struggle with where do I locate the truth of, of God, um, you know, in these. And I think Christian scripture functions in the same way. So that for instance, and I'm going to go ahead and refer back to, um, my book. Yeah, please. When when we get Christian writers talking about the end, um, when we get Christian writers talking about the return of Jesus, um, they go through um, shifts and changes about this. There's no unified voice. Some of those voices in uh, Christian scripture, New Testament, say Jesus is coming back like in our lifetime. I mean, don't marry. Paul says, you know, it'd be better if you weren't married. You know, I mean. Look, you know, things are urgent. And then later on, we find, you know, other texts that say, well, you know, we don't really know. I mean, this is in God's time, not our time. You know, I mean, and then we have the sort of I don't want to say the mother of all revelation, but we have the sort of or revelation for um, uh, Christians revelation. Um, which itself is dependent, and this is a point that most Christians just do not grasp, is dependent on a constellation of apocalyptic imagery that existed centuries before Revelation is written. Yeah. 
So in that sense, it is a continuation of apocalyptic literature. It's not unique. It is shaped and formed uniquely to address situations for Christians who are living in sort of the Mediterranean basin and what is now Turkey and, sure. and, and, um, other areas. Well, but, you say this beautifully in your book, by the way, I just have to, I, I have to interject this. You say we always have the choice between the dragon and the woman in revelation, right? Yeah, and this is yeah. part of what it's illuminating for us is this choice. And I, I think that choice precisely, uh, is what we've been talking about the entire time. So, but keep yeah. going. Please. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, I, that, well, that raises an interesting thing, right? I, I, I was joking earlier about binaries, right? Yep. Um, because you and I work in the academic world. We know binary is, is a bad word. It's like yeah. it's a cuss word. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, you know, we don't go with binaries. <laughs> Neuroscience tells us that our minds think in binaries. I mean, this is... Yeah. Left brain, right brain, I mean, but neuroscience and scientific investigation shows, I mean, this is why Taoism, I think, for instance, finds such resonance with some of us because Taoism sort of takes the the poles and 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 constantly they they interact, they play, they they you know, bounce off of one another. Mm. I think that there's an aspect in which we find if we, when we think about the choices between the woman and the dragon, Mm -hmm. there's a kind of hard simplicity there. But even within that, from that one pole to the other, the the continuum of choices or the continuum of struggles that we make, you know, are, are, you know, are profound. And I think that when we think in terms of binaries, we, we want to, we're trying to say, it's not just one or the other, yep. but if we think about the fact that our minds are wired to think that way, mm-hmm. then what we think about is that between the hard simplicity of those edges, there is a host of decisions. There's a host of realities that are constantly, um, you know, connecting, disconnecting uh, intentions. There's a host in that continuum that we live our lives, that existentially we just live our lives under. You know, it, it's funny you bring that up. So the next book I want to write, and I want to write it in a similar vein here, it's, I want to call it The Impossibility of Christian Ethics. Um, yeah. And the, the, <laughs> the point of it is to uh, pose in some ways Pilate and David uh, as the persons with whom we ought to most associate ourselves with, not in the sense that we should be like them, but that we are like them, and that we are drawn into a kingdom that we cannot enact because it would mean the devastation of this world and our families within it, Uh, and yet we cannot give ourselves over fully to a pragmatic view that rejects that either, and we're caught in this strange place where we're called to be, if you will, signposts to the kingdom, uh, enacting the kingdom in small ways as we can uh but <laughs> with, with not a lot else in some way i can't leave as christ asks me to my uh my wife i am married i will protect my family if necessary right mm-hmm. um that, that's why i think actually to you know in terms of the binary we 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 can oftentimes pose here, here's another binary that we run into david is good or David is evil, if, you know, there, there are those who would say that as well. I, he's a confusing and complex character, and there are many visions of who King David is, even within Scripture. Yeah. So you get, in some ways, sympathetic portrayals that celebrate uh, his manliness and his ability to kill Philistines and gather a 100 Philistine foreskins, for God's sake, as a dowry to Saul. Uh and there are then those passages whereby God in and of God's self addresses David and chronicles, I think, uh, and says, yeah, you're not going to build my temple. You're a man of blood, uh, yeah. which yeah. absolutely calls into question everything yeah. that he just did. Yeah. And what I think makes David interesting is that he accepts all of these roles. If I'm to project any unified vision of David, he accepts these roles and the strange tension of the world that he exists in and that we exist in as well. 
So if we emulate David in any way, it's always got to be within this framework uh, whereby we see that sometimes indeed we have to sin, but we never call it anything less than sin in the process. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't want to um, uh, go down too much further on my list of questions because I, I would like for us to get to Eckhart at some point. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Um, but I, I wanted in this moment, if you would have any other question for me. Yeah. So you, once we go to Eckhart, man, we're just going into a swamp, right? <laughs> no, good. I'm glad. Uh, yeah. My, my main question, my, my two main questions for you, uh, you've, you've already begun to address them. What is the hermeneutic? If you could define a hermeneutic principle or an interpretive principle through which you approach scripture, could you define it for me? Um, because that's what, like I said, I think that's how I read your book. At the end of the day, it's a lesson uh, through the most difficult scriptural texts as to how to read scripture with a sense of sanity to it. And, and I found that really helpful, and I hope other people find it helpful as well. And, and secondly, you also began to address this point. What do you interpret? Uh, you, you talk about this in your book, too, but I think it will be helpful here. What do you uh, interpret as Christ's return? And how do we make sense of that in today's world? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So sort of the hermeneutic I offered just a little earlier when I was talking about incarnation. Yeah. That what we have in, in these texts or narratives, um, they're narratives that we can never, uh, and this is uh, what's going to bother some people, sure. um, that we can never with certitude yeah. um, claim that the character of the divine is being mediated to us. I cannot go back and read the genocidal uh, maniac of uh, 1 Samuel 15 and think that that is narrating to me the character of God. Now, that said, when I want to make a claim then that Christ narrates the character of God, um, I can't make that claim with, with certitude. I can't make that claim as a provable claim to other human beings. What I can, what I can argue is that um, in, the, in the midst of all human tensions, this is what I have come to understand as um, saying something profoundly true and important about God. Um, that the suffering God, uh, as Bonhoeffer says, is the only God that helps that our task is to wait with Christ in Gethsemane, um, since we're in that season while this is being recorded. For those of you who may not have picked up, we're on Holy Saturday today. Um, and that uh, the task is to, um, to mediate um, that sense that uh, the solidarity of God with the human family was so um, uh, overwhelmingly uh, powerful and compelling that God entered into our suffering um, and through that suffering transforms it, transforms what seems like to be death into life, what seems like to be exhausted possibilities into to new um, and nourishing uh, possibilities for life. Um, now, once I've said that, once I've said that I cannot find certitude, True. it does not mean that I cannot find for me. Um, and then, but people will come back and they'll say, but, but you've just eviscerated the gospel or, you, you know, you know, you're being wimpy about this. <laughs> um, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, uh, doubt is not the enemy of faith. Certainty and certitude is. Um, I think that that's, I think that that's where I I come to this. So when I, when I approach the text, then um, I have to ask certain questions about, you know, what are the antecedents? Where did these texts generate from? What, what was the historical situation? I mean, pretty much every listener who's still listening to us at this point um, (laughs) understands that this is, one of the foundational aspects of approaching the text. Um, And when you do that, then you have to sort of come to an understanding of how apocalyptic literature functions, not just in scripture, 
uh, or what we call Jewish and Christian scripture, but how was it functioning in the culture at large? What were the, the tropes, the metaphors, the images um, that apocalyptic literature is using to construct for its readers and listeners a different world yep. than the one that they were living in. Mm-hmm. And when we come to that, then uh, apocalyptic literature does not function like the dispensationalists say it does um, as a blueprint for the end of the world or as a sort of this and this and this and this are going to happen. And then the end's going to come. We're going to let Trump, he's obviously the antichrist, et cetera, et cetera. Or we're going to elect Obama, uh, you know, when I was doing research for the book, you know, I went to a lot of the websites that said that Obama was the Antichrist. I'm sure that there are equal number of websites now that say that Trump is. The fact of the matter is, is that um, neither of those are. Um, and that later writer in in the, in the Christian scripture says there are many, anti- there are many Antichrists. You know, yeah. so they they weren't well, they were way, they were trying to get something deeper, which was yeah. what is it that brings death and destruction? What is the power of the demonic in the world? Now, having said that, then, and I, I hear that adorable child in the distance. <laughs> I was wondering if you could. Um, <laughs> I think you should bring them in so we can go viral. This kind of march, you, you know, like that. Um, so. So having said that, then, when we think about what the return of Christ looks like, um, we are given those um, paths, for instance, in the text of Revelation. Um, We either live into Babylon or we live into the New Jerusalem. Uh, Um, There is a certain way in which, you know, what is it that shapes us? What is it that forms our identity? Is it violence? Is Is it the securing of our security through violence? Um, that shapes us? Or is it the willingness to enter into um, the life of the world to such an extent that um, uh, we make ourselves vulnerable to the world in the way that Christ did? Now, now let me say at this point that that is for some people not an adequate hermeneutic for revelation, that it is undeniable in revelation, that at the end of the world, millions perish, that that the genocidal um, uh, maniac shows up at the end of the world. You cannot read the text and not see that. Um, Now, maybe, and maybe this is the mystery, um, but but what we do find is that whatever happens at the so-called end of the world um, is God's doing and not ours. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we we want to take into our hands the power of God to destroy the world. Um, and ultimately, this is where I really do struggle. And, and how do I reconcile my understanding of Christ as incarnation um, with a text like Revelation? And, and ultimately, I have to say, the writer uses all those apocalyptic images. The writer has a storehouse of metaphors and things to draw upon. Um, and you see uh, echoes of four Ezra. You see echoes of similar to Enoch. You see echoes of apocalyptic writing in Revelation itself. Um, but ultimately, this is, this is God's affair, not mine. My affair is to, to, to call people to the New Jerusalem or to point to the new Jerusalem and say, this is the way we were intended. Um, and there are ways of fleshing that out, of course, but, but this is how we were intended by their fruits. You shall know them. I mean, um, so now I, I feel like I'm just babbling at this point. No, you're not. This is, this is all very, very important. Keep uh, finished, please. But, but, but Christ, and I know this sounds so trite and, and, uh, and and the fact of the matter is, though, is that it's the disciplines. And you talk about this in your book. Um, what are the disciplines that we engage in um, that that uh, form us and shape us from the inside out, not from the outside in, but from the inside out to be able to to be that um, instrument of peace that Francis talks about or to be able to be that that manifestation of the divine 
And, and it's in every act, in every uh, ability that we have to enter into um, that, that Christ returns. And, and uh, I think Annie Dillard wrote a great book called, um, she's the one that wrote um, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Pulitzer Prize winning book. Um, she does a lot of great stuff with science, I think. And she wrote this book called For the Time Being. And she, in the book, says that God is manifest to the ability that we allow it to be or that we desire it to be or that we make it to be. Mm -hmm. Um, To the extent that we are on the field, so to speak, um, God becomes known. And that sounds trite, but, you know, ultimately it's incarnational. It is. Because the only God that matters is the one that embodies God's self in the world. Indeed. No, I, I agree. This is the, you know, the, this comes out for me, for, for me, ultimately, Christ becomes the answer to the problem of suffering in the world. It may still be as bad of an answer as anything else, but the, the idea here is that God, the, the God of uh, reason, as I call it, does not matter. <laughs> it, it does not matter at a pragmatic level. We can intellectually perhaps affirm it. But who cares at the end of the day if God does not come to us? And I I even want to make a a strong cosmological claim, come to the cosmos as a whole, as the one who will draw it into what it was always supposed to have been, then this is all for naught. Yeah, there's a certain sense then in which eschatology is a horizon of hope. Yep, that's right. That that God is the future not only luring us, uh, but the future coming toward us. That's right. Um, you know, there's a there is there is a mutuality um, mm-hmm. in that. I think actually I, I like the way you said that. Hebrews, rather than Paul, gets this right. Faith isn't at the bottom. Hope is at the bottom, and hope yields a certain amount of faith, which manifests itself in love. But without that hope, we have nothing. <laughs> in many ways, that is our visceral incarnational way into any of this. All right. So now I want to uh, sort of maybe finish a little bit with Eckhart, if you sure. don't mind, because I, yeah. I have you and, and you mentioned him. <laughs> so one of the, I mean, I, I have Eckhart by my nightstand and I read him uh, sometimes right before I go to sleep. Uh, does crazy thing with my dreams. <laughs> um, but he at one point says that our humankind's, Last and most noble parting is when we take leave of God for God's own sake. Hmm. Now, I would be interested in knowing, as as you think, or I don't know if you've heard that before. I actually haven't. That's beautiful, though. But we have to leave God. It's a noble um, parting. It is a noble distancing Mm -hmm. to leave God for, for God's own sake. Now, what, what what would you make of that? Because it changed my life, that quote. I, I, so perhaps this is where our Kantianisms t- come together in uh, the provisionality of all truth, right? Um, as you stated it well. Each and everything we say of God, I, I like to interpret. I actually interpret this similarly through Anselm. God is greater than that which we can conceive or God... If we ascribe something to God, God, for instance, is love. God is the love greater than which we can conceive. That's how I like to reinterpret Anselm from a sort of Christocentric lens. Mm -hmm. But what I would take Eckhart to be stating here is that perhaps our silence in front of God, like Job at the end of the book of Job, is our best response that we can engage cataphatically with speaking of God up to a point, mm-hmm. but the silence itself must become our most authentic speaking at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to bring that one of two ways. One, the way that I think Eckhart would mean it into the, if you will, the infinite, um, what, what's the word? The, the infinity of God that can never be expressed in fullness. But I also want to draw it out Christocentrically in the sense that in the silence, we open ourselves to the beauty of incarnation and what it could possibly be for us to allow God to speak, 
to us rather than us speaking for God. Mm -hmm. That's how I want to initially interpret that statement. Yeah. And it's hard, you know, I mean, because the minute that we, you know, it's, it's, it's Taoist in that, in that, you know, those who speak don't know. Exactly. Yep. You know, those who know don't I'm speak. Doing, funny, I'm doing the Tao Te Ching and the uh, Chuang Tzu right now with uh, my Asian philosophy class. So every, yeah. every Taoist thing you're bringing up is making a lot of sense. A couple of years ago, I, I lived in London um, for a semester. I was the director of our semester program. And I get on the tube every morning with the Tao Te Ching, you know, because you could read it in short little bursts yeah. from exactly. stops and stuff. And I, I kept, well, it just, it, I, I found it a profoundly compelling text. And, and I enjoyed that part in your book where you talked about, you know, oh, you know, Jesus was Buddhist, you know. I mean, and I, I wrote down, no, Jesus probably wasn't a Buddhist, but uh, I'm pretty sure he was Taoist. He might have been um, Taoist. <laughs> Uh, first shall be last, last shall be first, you know, <laughs> the parables of reversal, um, the way that, that Wu Wei, the way that the, the, that, you know, God works in the world. I mean, yeah. I don't want to get too far off that though, be, uh, off on that because we can, we're going to have to draw this to a close if we're supposed to be limiting this to an hour. Absolutely. But I, I did want to say that Eckhart gave me the ability to stay silent and and also the ability to understand that simply I have to come to grips with everything that I say yep. about God may well in fact be a projection. Yep. And there's nothing, even my my desire to to move to the least projective places, you know, that that the most powerful thing has the least power. Yep. Um or the most grand thing is found in the most mundane and and even dirty um, thing, um, but that I, I find myself sort of on that on that moment where everything that I say um, is provisional, and maybe that's where the life of faith is lived out. That we're pushed out into the world, but at the same time, there is that aspect that comes and forms the boundaries. Yeah. Um, so that we always have to understand that faith lives between the being pushed out and the boundary that forms the limits of our understanding. Absolutely. And um, and there we're, we're sort of, we're not exactly wandering in the wilderness, um, but but we have to always be cognizant of the fact that, that we can't be, <laughs> this Kantian comes in, um, we can't be certain of any of this. That, that when I take leave of God, when I take leave of all my constructs, when I take leave of Miyagi God and Jersey God and Anhippi God and, and all of these other constructs of the divine, um, it's only those constructs can actually keep me from an encounter with the thing itself. Sure. Of the Ding an Sieg. But, but, you know, even there, you know, how, do I, how am I sure? Maybe, so, there, maybe there's a helpful point then to uh, end on here that uh, we are perhaps in very, very good company as uh, the cry of dereliction seems to indicate that all of us, Christ himself included, who is uh, presumably the incarnate one, uh, says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> yeah, that's a good that's a good word for Holy Saturday. As, as we await um, new life. And await we will. Yep. Thank you, Eric. Thank I you. Hope, I hope everybody goes out and buys that book now on sale on Kindle for two ninety nine. That's right. Both of them. Homebrewed Christianity uh, Guide to the End Times and Homebrewed Christianity Guide to God. It's going to be a little seminary right there in that 10-book series. <laughs> it really will. 